Um, beginning with, uh, I'd like to thank Frank, Rebecca, and everyone at the Martin and Siegel Center for their support and for giving us the space here to have the round table. Uh, from our program, I want to thank the Sydney E. Cohn Chair, Distinguished Professor Marvin Carlson, who's here with us. I'd also like to thank the Vera Mallory Roberts Chair, Distinguished Professor David Saverin. The PhD program in theater and performance at the Graduate Center was also instrumental in making this event happen, especially our executive officer, Peter Eckersall, here in the front row, and our assistant program officer, Lynette Gibson. Uh, we received a grant from the Doctoral Students Council to make this day possible, <coughs> the Doctoral Theater Students Association, uh, several students who were volunteers throughout the day, and thank you to our publishing panel, Susan uh, Tamariello is here somewhere, and um, Norm Hershey from Oxford University Press, and uh, Mary Ellen Sanford from TDR. Um, I'm gonna let Erica introduce everyone individually on the panel, but also uh, I'm sure that you would not have been here were it not for these people being here as well. So thank you, thank you to all of our visiting scholars. And um, I also want to give a special thank you to Professor Erica Lin, who is our faculty advisor for this event. And we have one extra approaching dance t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> That's just for Erica. <laughs> um, I also want to take a moment to thank uh, my fellow conference organizing committee members, Jennifer Thompson, Elul Akunja, Phoebe Ramsey, Margaret Edwards, and Janet Werther. I didn't forget anyone. Right? And, and finally, um, any conference is only as good as its attendees and the work that you bring. And I think we all saw what a high level the, the work was today and how generous the conversations were and for that, we are very grateful. Thank you all so much for being here. And um, now I will turn it over to Professor Erica Lin, and she is an associate professor in the PhD program in theater and performance here at the Graduate Center. She's also the author of Shakespeare and the Materiality of Performance, which won the 2013 David Beventine Award for Best New Book in Early Drama Studies. She is currently writing a book on seasonal festivities and early modern commercial theater and she is also co-editing a collection on early modern games. Her essay on sexuality and Morris dancing in the Oxford Handbook of Dance and Theater received honorable mention for the Society for, Society for the Society for the Study of Early Modern Women's 2016 Award for Best Article on Women and Gender. So that's a mouthful. <laughs> um, she currently serves on the Board of Trustees for the Shakespeare Association of America and as the book review editor for Theater Survey. So. Thank you, Ryan, and thank you for the t-shirt, <laughs> which I did not know was gonna happen until I walked in this morning. Uh, welcome to everyone, and thank you for joining us. It's my great pleasure to moderate this round table session. Uh, our conference today brings together participants from many disciplines to consider how transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary approaches help us to think through the theoretical and methodological issues at stake in research on dance movement and performance. <coughs> this round table will seek to weave together some of the threads from the working sessions that took place this morning and afternoon. And so before I introduce our distinguished speakers, I just want to give you a quick overview of our round table format. So we'll begin with each of our panelists speaking briefly about their own approaches to research on dance and movement, and any key questions and discoveries that arose during the working sessions today. And then we'll have discussion among all the roundtable participants, and finally, we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Since this session is a roundtable, let me introduce our distinguished guests all at once, and this is gonna be in alphabetical order, which is how they appear on your program. Unfortunately, Nadine George Graves is unable to join us today, but I'm very happy to introduce our other speakers. Thomas F. DeFrance is Chair of African and African American Studies at Duke University. He's the author of Dancing Revelations, Alvin Ailey's Embodiment of African American Culture, which won the 2005 De La Torre Bueno Prize from the Society of Dance History Scholars. His edited collections include the prize-winning volume, Dancing Many Drums, Excavations in African American Dance, Black Performance Theory, co-edited with Anita Gonzalez, and most recently, 
uh, choreography and corporeality, Relay in Motion, co-edited with Filippo Rothfield. A past president of the Society of Dance History Scholars, Professor DeFrance is the director of the research group Slippage, Performance, Culture, Technology, and the working group Black Performance Theory and the Collegium for African Diaspora Dance. His many creative projects as a choreographer, dramaturg, performer, writer, director, it keeps going, um, <laughs> include most recently Fast Dance Past at the Detroit Institute for the Arts and Reverse Gesture Review, commissioned by the National Museum in response to the work of Kara Walker. V.K. Preston is an assistant professor at the University of Toronto Center for Drama, Theater, and Performance. Her scholarly interests include dance studies, circumatlantic performance, gender, performance historiography, and performance studies. She's writing a book on witches' dances, a project supported by the John Carter Brown Library, where she's currently in residence. Professor Preston has published widely on both historical and contemporary topics, including 17th century French ballet and indigenous histories, contemporary visual and performance art, and archives, dictionaries, and translations. Her co-authored essay, Tendering the Flesh, the ABCs of Dave St. Pierre's Contemporary Utopias, won the 2013 Richard Plant Award from the Canadian Association for Theater Research. She's also the recipient of an early career fellowship for the Australian Research Council's History of Emotions Project. And Professor Preston has asked me also mention that she and the his theater historian Julia Fawcett at UC Berkeley are convening an Astor working session titled Resurrecting the Extraordinary Bodies of Pre-1850 Performance. So they would love to hear from anyone here who might be interested in applying. Deadline is June 1st. <laughs> Catherine Profeta is an associate professor in the Department of Drama, Theater, and Dance at Queens College, CUNY. Her longest term credits are as a dramaturg with choreographer and visual artist, Ralph Lamone, 1997 to present, and as a founding member, choreographer, and occasional performer with Elevator Repair Service Theater Company, 1991 to present. She's also done dramaturgical work in dance theater and points in between with Julie Tamer, Karen Coonrod, Annie Dorson, David Thompson, Alexander Beller, Nora Chimar, uh, Grisha Coleman, and Theater for a New Audience. She holds a Doctorate of Fine Arts from the Yale School of Drama in the Department of Dramaturgy and Dramatic Criticism. Her first book, Dramaturgy in Motion, examines the labor of the dramaturg in contemporary dance and movement performance. Her writing has also appeared in Performing Arts Journal, Theater Magazine, Movement Research Performance Journal, Theater, Dance, and Performance <coughs> Training, and TCG's The Production Notebooks. Paul A. Scolieri is Associate Professor of Dance at Barnard College, where he's also affiliate faculty in Africana Studies, Critical Interdisciplinary Studies, and the Columbia University PhD program in theater. He is the author of Dancing the New World, Aztec Spaniards and the Choreography of Conquest, which won the 2014 Oscar G. Brockett Book Prize for Dance Research from the CORD, as well as garnering a special citation for the Society of Dance History Scholars de la Toro Bernardo Prize and Honorable mention in the Sally Baines Publication Prize from Master. A former board member of several scholarly organizations, Professor Scolieri has also served as a panelist for the NEH, the NEA, they still exist, uh, and the New York State Council of the Arts. His new book is, for, is a forthcoming biography of the father of American dance, Ted Sean, a project supported by an ACLS Burkhart Fellowship. Please join me in welcoming our roundtable participants. So we're going to begin with uh, each of the speakers uh, saying a few words about their own approaches and methods on research and dance uh, and uh, their own take on transdisciplinarity and any kind of questions, int uh, interesting problems, discoveries arising from the working sessions. I'm going to ask the speakers to please use a microphone. There are several of them. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a round table, it's two small round tables <laughs> with several mics on them. So. Anyhow, VK, do you want to get us started? This is the, oh, it's the amplifying kind. Okay. Um, I feel like I, I'm somebody who had a dance background. I, I started when I was a little kid and did ballet and then sort of got injured and went into contemporary dance and got injured and went more and more into improvisation. The idea that I would ever write about Baroque and 17th century ballet was pretty much like, 
And there was a moment, it was a forced situation, it was a, sort of a round of exams. And uh, I spoke French, I'm a Quebecer, and, or a Quebecer of the heart, let's say. And so I started reading some of the early ballet texts. And the first one um, that I read, again, with great resistance and reluctance, ended with an alchemist showing the remains of Moors burned to death um, as a final scene. I had lived in Warsaw, I had lived in, in Germany, and the sort of depth of the violence utterly shocked me. And so I came to a project with a degree of resistance to the archive that was both from my own training as a dancer and um, from a political position. And in a weird way that's become, like somebody described it as so old it's new again, like it's become a way of coming back to certain kinds of collections. I sometimes work with bibliographies as written out 150 years ago. What's in this collection? Why is it in this collection? Why is it together? Um, sometimes as a result, finding really extraordinary relationships between things that I would have thought were the most sort of contemporary way that you could look at these and finding, in fact, it's written in the introduction to the 400-year-old book on page two. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think the, the tendency for historians to drop out questions of sexuality, questions of gender, questions of uh, cross-cultural transmission and right in nationhood uh, is continually defied by what happens when you get close to archives. For that matter, though, I think they can be very proximal. It's been, um, I started looking at 17th century French dances. I thought I was being obnoxious and intentionally so by saying, well, in the case of Quebec, and I would now say much of Northeastern North America, um, these are lands claimed in, in colonial contexts um, by France from this period. So I look at French language material written in the Northeast as well which in the context of Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Commission has meant reading the sort of texts of moments of transmission, of plague, of the emergence of capitalism. And so the colonization of very, very near has been radical for me. <coughs> okay, um, I'm starting with my approach and I guess you did a little background to your approach which I think is makes sense for me too because I was definitely trained as a dancer, and I was a dancer who hung out with the theater people. <laughs> <laughs> and so in that, going back and forth and back and forth, and then also going to a school where there was no formal dance program undergrad, but there was a formal theater program, I started both in the people I associated with and in what I was studying, feeling very natural crossing that supposed boundary all the time. Um, when I joined Elevator Repair Service Theater, the first show I was the light board op, but starting the second show I was the choreographer and then I was in a position of trying to get these theater bodies to, to dance all the time. Um, when I went to grad school I thought, okay, I also had been collaborating with Julie Tamor and basically being her dramaturg before I knew what that word meant. And when I went back to school, I thought, okay, now I'm gonna go be a theater person. I'm gonna get a proper theater degree, bye-bye dance. <laughs> And I was just very, very lucky. I mean, I guess maybe some of you read my book, so you know this story anyway. But I was just very lucky because Ralph Lemon showed up at Yale School of Drama at the same time as I showed up. And then I didn't have to say bye-bye dance. And I could continue sort of going back and forth across that supposed boundary. But I really feel like the only thing that makes it a boundary is both producing structures of how work gets made and you know academic departments where whether the, the theater and the dance program are together in one department or at opposite ends of the campus can make a humongous difference in what kind of performing arts get made in that school. Just, it's just about proximity and how we understand each other. Um, so my sort of approach and interest as a scholar is um, to write about rehearsal rooms and training and what goes on in those spaces. And that was very easy to do with this uh, first first book on dramaturgy and now I'm kind of in this pause wondering what the next project will be. But I do think it will be something about how bodies and minds are rehe rehearsed and trained 
for performance. Like not as interested in the final piece, but rather the history and the theory behind how we get there and what assumptions we have about what we're doing and how we decide what good and bad is <laughs> and, and all that stuff. So yeah, I'm currently thinking about some kind of history and theater performer training. I'm also very interested still in the, in the chapters of my books that were about an audience and relationship to an audience and this whole idea of the artist's work uh, configured as a gift instead of a transaction. But can we really, is that a nice pretty myth and story we tell ourselves? Because everything about how art gets made is, is transactional <laughs> these days or always was maybe, I don't know. Um, and I'm interested in the part of the book I wrote about intercultural collaboration because it just seems to get more, in, more urgent, more interesting, more thorny. So I felt like maybe I was only scratching the surface there. Um, but whatever I go after this sort of pause to breathe, <laughs> it will probably be about um, the rehearsal room and the training room more than the finished piece. So I, I really like this format that we're doing now as our round table. So um, I was a very nervous child in Indianapolis, Indiana, nervous with lots of energy and, um, you know, so kind of living in this vibration. And the youngest of four kids and the other kids were all very sports minded. And um, so I knew that I wanted something else because I had to distinguish myself. So dance and <laughs> gymnastics and tumbling and doing shows on the corner for passing cars um, was really important. Um, with my little friends and you know the stuff that we would do and then you know so always didn't dance and but also in music and maybe it kind of speaks transdisciplinarity and you know in my family in Indianapolis Indiana um, we all took music lessons so this is kind of before um, so everyone played an instrument of some sort not like one of those families but just you know it's what you do as your aspirational middle class <laughs> so playing the piano and playing the cello and playing the string bass and kind of kept all that going. And then those interests between dance and music, those kinds of formal music, music was much more formalized and dance was something that our family did. Um, and then as I kind of realized that I was uh, gonna stay engaged in the arts in that way, um, the writing stuff and the research came from this kind of inclination to better understand what's it doing in the world. So that's kind of always been the question that I'm chasing and still chasing it. Um, not so much what's it for, which kind of forecloses possibility, I think, but what's it doing there? So what's it becoming? What's it enabling? What's it allowing? And that kind of curiosity um, is, is kind of the thing that drives the, the approach to research. And you know, so thinking back on being a little boy and, and doing shows outside of our, little, of our house in Indianapolis, Indiana on the corner, um, you know, what was that doing for a queer kid a queer high yellow kid in Indianapolis, his father was on the school board, you know, like, so how does this, how does dance and performance do something and what is it trying to make, make possible in the world? Um, that's where that curiosity. And then um, for me working in black studies, I mean, I've always been you know, like, okay, well we need so much more research on black people. It's just like ridiculous. <laughs> so we just need so much more. So keep opening that space, keep opening the space, keep opening the space. Um, so a lot of the research projects that I get involved in are spaces that um, I, I tend to think of them as opening forays, like here's an idea, someone else please take that on and move it forward or move it sideways or do something against it. Um, but that's where a lot of the, the projects come from, these spaces that, that feel like they could be opened up in, in different ways. And I've been really curious in, in terms of centering kind of black aesthetics, if you will, but then being really concerned about African-American exceptionalism it's very complicated, you know, so as we get to travel the world or not or have conversations with people around the world, you know, there's still a, a very deep-seated and productive um, um, cynicism and suspicion of the U.S. Exce American exceptionalism as well there should be. At the same time, black American experience has produced something utterly impossible and, and unsolvable and um, uh, uh, just ridiculous, you know, ridiculous. Uh, that has such a huge impact over the world, whether it's about claiming an exceptionalism that marks it as being special in a way that's, you know, it's not about a kind of quality, but a, a quantity of experience maybe. And so I've been thinking about that a lot, and that's kind of a 
inside the, the projects that I'm, I'm moving towards. I'm also lucky enough to work as an artist um, and something I always take from working with Catherine on her work with Ralph Lemon, talking about him as an unreliable narrator. And I've been really working with this as, as an artist, you know, we get to be unreliable narrators all the time. And I can say things that I don't mean and I don't have to validate them. I don't, because I'm opening a space that you know, it seems like it needs to exist now. But as a researcher and working the archives and politics of citation, I have other kinds of questions and responsibilities and tethers to other people in the room um, where you know what is responsibility to an archive or to the structures of feeling that other people have already encountered and, and made present. So that, that kind of bouncing between those two kinds of modes of address to others seems really important to me. Hi. So I guess the theme is I started off as a dancer too. <laughs> <laughs> I actually wanted to be a dance professor because I thought I would get free studio space. That was my <laughs> skewed sense of how academia <laughs> worked. <laughs> But, that's true. Um, but, you know, this, I went to an interdisciplinary graduate program, the Performance Studies program at NYU, and really at a time where I felt like all of our conversations were dominated by questions of methodology. So we talked endlessly about methodology, but we're tra we weren't trained in any methodology, even, <laughs> in, right? So, so I actually left for a bit and <clears throat> went to an anthropology department and started to train linguistics and figured I needed to do, so, but I, it was fantastic because I also don't think I would have developed the project I ultimately developed in a disciplinary home, but I felt like I needed to, um, I needed more <coughs> tools than just the kind of discussion of interdisciplinary, um, interdisciplinarity would allow me. So as soon as I was done with my first project, which was really started off kind of with a methodological question, how do we write about dances we can't see or some foolish sort of question like that. After I finished graduate school, I said, well, I'm going to go study um, Laban analysis. I'm going to study movement analysis. I want to figure out a way to get back to my training and with the belief that really looking at dancing and looking at choreography and movement was going to be a vital and important way of um, engaging with dance and dance studies and dance history. And I think it is. And it's part of what I teach and it's part of what I preach to the undergraduates about learning to look not necessarily love and analysis, but about movement analysis and what you see and patterns of experience and quali qualitative movement. All of that is important, but it has almost nothing to do with my research. So I don't really feel transdisciplinary as much as I feel sort of disciplinarily promiscuous or something. I sort of just, <laughs> you know, but I think that's what came across today, even in our panel today, that different projects, different texts, different um, parts of projects require different tools, right? And I think there's a way that we are always aspiring to because we like to integrate and we like to combine and a lot of the work we deal with is calling for so many different ways of examining it and we want to make sure we capture the complexity of it. But I, I think, it, and I, I hope we hear from you as well, um, that sometimes there's something beautiful about the disciplinary, about a kind of um, slow looking through one lens consistently. I, I, I just find in my own habit of reading, I prefer <coughs> works that sort of not as the end <laughs> ending of a way of looking at it, but as a complete and thorough, deep way of looking at an idea or, a or, or of a phenomenon. So it's just interesting to me that while I preach interdisciplinary and like to teach it, <coughs> and have students think across different um, disciplinary boundaries, I also find that my own sort of, and increasingly as I get older and deeper into the archive, is to, you know, <coughs> where I situate myself as a, really a historian. So, um, so that was one thing, just thinking about what, what is the value in always trying to privilege transdisciplinarity, but when we don't have to be all things at once for one. And then, um, but I was also thinking today, and I've been thinking, and probably should have been uh, always, but in the past few months, just thinking about the sort of um, material conditions of dance and scholarly research and thinking about how expensive projects are to travel. We were just in the last session that I went to, so much of, I think, the underlying, um, uh, what wasn't said was, what is required to stay in an archive for the long duration that's necessary to get to the bottom of something, to have the funding to do that work, right? And so all of those structures, which are really shape the kind of possibilities for transdisciplinary that I think we're here to talk about. Does that make 
Absolutely, and I think that's a wonderful touch point to talk about some of these questions, so thank you. And thank you all for some wonderful discussion during the working session. I'd like to um, take your point, Paul, about um, the institutional questions of access to ask about the ethics of various research methodologies. Um, and one of the things that, uh, uh, Tommy, you were saying about the um, fact that artists offer unreliable narratives because you're licensed to, right? And then um, <coughs> the idea that um, is art non-transactional that Catherine brought up, right? And the fact that it's not economic means that you're outside of the realm of needing certain kinds of, you know, uh, of commodifiable notions of evidence and methodology. And so I was wondering then if we can talk about what it means to have an ethical methodology. And I'm not saying it's not ethical for you to get a grant, Paul, to go to an archive and do some work, right? Um, but just thinking about what these questions are about um, the ethics of a particular method, but also the ethics of transdisciplinarity, given that disciplines are based in terms of these institutional structures. Something that came up in the morning session as well that I was part of, I, I don't know if this is, I don't know if this is right, but I was feeling, I'm thinking a lot about how expansive and how much work there needs to be done in black studies and dance studies. It's, it's, it's overwhelming, but also thinking that the way the, the, the economy of academia is with book publishing, with getting jobs, it's sort of, you're driven by the need to be very original, <laughs> right? And to be exceptional in that way and to be marketable in that particular way, which I think almost runs against what the field most needs, which is collaborative research, transnational research, right? The way scientists organize knowledge production, that so much of the burden of knowing these histories and these experiences are tied up in that one scholar who has a job that could fund that work, right? And so how do we actually build, the? and I think this is what we're doing today too, right? But how do we build those networks to allow that kind of multi multiplicity? So the burden of transdisciplinarity and the depth of knowledge doesn't fall on one person, and how do we create an environment that allows for that work when we have a kind of structure that's asking for individuality, differentiation, and exceptionalism? Well, when you mention ethics of research methodologies, where I go immediately is working with people who are still alive <laughs> and how uh, I suppose there's an ethics of how I represent someone who's deceased that exists as well, but the, the consequences feel much more acute if I'm representing someone who, who's still here and doesn't like the way they're represented. Um, and it's funny how Tommy mentions uh, Ralph Lemon's unreliability because I think of this, I thought of this directly when I'm sort of telling tales from the rehearsal room because Ralph Lemon tells tales from the rehearsal room within the context of his work too. And he sits down and he, talks to the audience on a mic, and uh, he says, oh yeah, after I did this uh, exercise, Dow Jones wouldn't talk to me for four years. And I know it was just six months, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it sounds better. And that's, you know, he's right within his art. And so I'm very conscious when I'm telling these stories of the rehearsal room in my books of like, well, what is my responsibility? I don't have the same freedom Ralph does, but on the other hand, we all heard uh, in the publishing session today that narrative is, you know, is how we re, I, I kind of, there are ways to resist that a little bit, but mostly I just buy it. Like, I love a good story, a story draws me in, so I believe in the power of story. It's just a question of when our story is manipulative and unethical <laughs> in the way we tell them. Um, so I just, I have, I come up with a way to try and be rigorous in the way I take notes and I come up with a way to, to check with people later on if what I, I think happened is what they think happened to. But then I also have to, um, and it's in my book, just put a big disclaimer that there are going to be multiple stories of what happened and this is what it looked like from, from my lens. Um, and with that, I hope my ethical bases are covered. If awareness of the dilemma is enough, you know, to cover my ethical bases, then I'm okay. But <laughs> it's always a little more than just that. Um, I think the ethics question is the key question. And 
um, I think by becoming something of an accidental historian who approached it as a performer, like, you're going to let me look at these things? Okay. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and then actually started to accumulate um, uh, some experiences. I, I entered more almost philologically, <coughs> like following particular words, following particular um, scenarios and uh, constructions that repeat over time. Um, what that has led me to, and that of course is also your own intuition and taste, and um, has actually engaged engaged me in levels of ethics. I certainly never entered into a dance archive expecting to be looking for the persecutions. When I started reading, and and it was also a bit imposed for whatever reason that works for me, I guess, but. When I started reading the witch stuff, I was like, Meh, I don't need that. I already do queer stuff, and I do this, and I'm like, why do I also want to add all this second wave feminist stuff? <laughs> and then I started reading about histories of sexual violence and histories of people imprisoned without trial for three years and having multiple children by their wardens, and you're like, oh, <laughs> this is not going to be an easy archive. And it's entirely engaged with histories of colonization and race and inequality and um, disability. And so that was one site in which where somewhere where the sort of popular slighting that's so habitual of a class of historical victims had actually concealed from me too how serious some of these constructions that are ingrained into Disney movies and every other thing, right? That they're, they're still ongoing machines of you have to defeat the witch by the end of the... <laughs> children's book. Um, and then in another context, but not in disconnected archives, um, similarly around some of the uh, uh, language archives, I started uh, because I found uh, some dance terminology in a uh, French and Wombat, which is Huron, um, language text in 2011, started slowly working away at this text and finding it very interesting. I didn't have the historical context of what I was looking at. What I was looking at was a th very deep set of translations, you know, hundreds of pages of translations for an indigenous language that was, at least from what I was realizing at the time, no longer spoken. Um, and then now, realizing it's in the middle of a revivification process that people are teaching um, and learning <coughs> languages in a way that all of the questions about past and present are a, culturally not <laughs> commensurate, but B, um, these archives are the archives of languages of the very lands that we're on that evade some of the questions of NAGPRA, which is the return of uh, remains. So we're ending up in profoundly ethical questions, and those are the collections that, I mean, Every other university has some of this stuff. So, yeah, that'll be. Thinking about this, um, this question of who gets to tell whose story that, you know, appropriation, so we're not done with appropriation, we haven't figured out how to talk about it yet. But that's, that's the heart of this kind of, another heart. There are lots of hearts to this question of ethical, you know, research, the ethics of research methodologies. But it's like, how do you, um, so there's a question of method and there's a question of object and there's a question of address. And those are the things that I like to try to think about, you know, and entangle them and let them coerce and let them fall into each other. But they can be untangled and made distinctive. And then, they, you know, we don't experience them maybe in our lives that way separately. But, um, you know, it can, it can be useful to set an ethical compass to think about address, object, and approach. Uh, what was the third one? Sorry. Address, object, and, and method. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, but, to, you know, to kind of think about, like, how... Who, who, whose story is getting told and, and who's the storytelling for. I think the last four or five years I've been trying to center black people and that's entirely imagined, it's an imaginative speculative space because what does that even mean? But trying to center black people in the, the concept of the, the theoretical projects. So to do that though, as and this came up in our group, like so we're thinking about Michael Jackson, but if we center Michael Jackson in tradition of black performance in the US, not always in relationship to pop culture and largely white audiences, but in relationship to itself. So public performance in relationship to church practice, where you get a larger 
group of mostly black people and you know keep moving that back to the spaces of the family where maybe it's all black people so centering that is a way to start thinking about what Michael Jackson's up to um, could maybe produce a different approach to a part of a project so maybe that's just an ethical kind of um, consideration is about how how are we addressing the objects how are we conceiving of the objects and what is it we need the objects to do in the world because that's ultimately the most important ethical question is what do we want our research to do um, how is it you know helping reveal process as you're saying or or reveal um, you know narratives of dance that are long gone but you know can help us understand what's happening now yeah I'm I keep <clears throat> for me ethics right now I'm, I'm writing this biography of Ted Sean and so so much of it is and I'm not trained to write a biography but there's a lot of theories of biography and life writing that are dealing with all of these ethical issues some of which I don't necessarily consider ethical if it's just about sort of you know bourgeois values or so you know <laughs> it's not about you know a political ethics or but you know I, I'm grateful that and I the the Ted Sean archive is vast and all over the place and I'm re and I mean that literally in different archives from Kinsey's archives with uh, sexual histories that Kinsey scientists took of dancers in the basement of a dance bookshop on 57th Street, right? Yeah, and so and so these dancers form part of the Kinsey report, including Sean's. So, um, so there, and then also reading redacted letters between gay dancers during World War II. So reading through the redactions. So I'm already, and the Kinsey archives are closed. You could read through them, but you can't read the exact reports. There's a very calculated. Um, uh, uh, they're closed off to read the act, and they're in a kind of code that you can't read unless you're one of the scientists. But there, you could read general information about them. So I'm reading an archive that's already been redacted, right? And kind of politically around sexuality, and then the letters between, you know, there's 50 years of letters between Ted Sean and Ruth St. Dennis, which are, you know, here are these two extremely public people kind of giving a, a face for what dance might mean, or, you know, naming American dance, but their letters to one another are these painful, um, personal stories of these two queer people trying to define what it meant to be married uh, uh, dancers in America, right? And and so to think, you know, for, for me the project is actually what's going on this internal um, struggle um, and reading and, and in contact with all of these theorists of sexuality. Havelock Ellis, the father of eugenics, was a counselor to them both, right? Um, so it's just to me the story is about that gap between this very public formation of dance and these very and how it, it relates to um, these very personal sexual histories that both were trying very hard to manage. Then of course Ted Sean leaves this great letter to all my future biographers. <laughs> Here are my suggestions of how to write this book, right? <laughs> and he writes his own memoir and then in 69 right as Stonewall is about to happen, decides he needs to tell the story again. This is actually after Ruth's death. Um, um, and he says he needs to tell the story again. Basically, he wants to say how his life has sort of informed the social change that has happened around gay identity. And he has a heart attack in the middle of it once he starts talking about Martha Graham, which in a way was sort of, in, but this is, this is all to say that there was a desire, there was a tremendous, the way I sort of reconcile it one way is that there was a tremendous desire for him to tell a story about and revalue his life and his work and sort of what he was very clear about, the sort of racist, um, anti-Semitic, um, even hom deeply homophobic parts of his own life and writings and trying to amend for it. But I guess it's to say, I have to read that. I mean, even though you know, it's the most deeply personal thing, it's actually what was driving his vision of America, you know, for dance and training a sort of legacy that we still sort of have with us. Yeah, I find this fascinating because uh, what each of you are talking about in different ways is a combination of how we uh, understand absence and you know what's missing, right? And then how we understand relation, right? And that relation can be between uh, two people that you're actually talking about uh, in your work, or it can be about your own position relative to the people that you're speaking for. And this speaks to Tommy's point about who's doing the telling, right? And what your relationship to that is. And it speaks to Catherine's point about um, what your status is when you don't agree with somebody else's story, right? There are two realities mm -hmm. happening simultaneously and uh, what happens in the archives, right? When the d extant evidence that's remaining is all from one side because the other side has been decimated, but then there's this, the, the absence is then um, reimagined in a different way when you have a, a language that is now reliving in a different way. And so I was wondering if we could think about 
that question then, right, of absence and relation to our objects of study, right, um, in uh, asking that question then, well, what do we want the research to do? And this is Tommy's question, right? Depends on what we want it to do. And we each have different goals. Yeah, I mean, it's good, you know, it's fantastic that we have different goals and different ambitions and different, you know, sort of readerships and addresses to students or other faculty or colleagues around the world. I mean, that's just, you know, it, it, it's pretty glorious. It's not, um, it's not valuing one over another. It's recognizing difference. And, you know, this language of diversity has come back into the academy big time in the last three years. And, you know, I think, it, I think it's about biogenetic diversity as we're all kind of um, understanding climate change more deeply and understanding the, you know, the, the need for diversity in, in a kind of cellular level, if you will an organic level, but then, you know, that turns back into the academic discourse of we need diversity approaches and experience and backgrounds. Um, but this, this question uh, came up in our group too about absence and we didn't actually address ephemerality, but kind of got in there and we got into some thorny but juicy part about choreography and improvisation. Um, but there is a way that the, you know, these questions are kind of, you know, does, is the dance there? What are the remains of the performance? Um, we're not, and I say that in a snarky way, we're not done with those questions, but we're trying to kind of resist them, you know, in this kind of way that dance is absent, it's an absent present, you know, like, it, we know we're there, but I think even your question brings us back into that encounter in a certain kind of way. And it is a challenge for dance. I mean, I, I think of it in terms of um, dance really is trying to live outside of language, and then our task is to keep fixing it back into language, like <laughs> relentlessly, <laughs> we're gonna make it work on this, you know, on this little keyboard, it's gonna fit somehow. <laughs> um, and you know, what we know from kind of everything that we do that we, you know, need outsides of language that dance, dance help, can help us with that. Not always, not only, but can help us towards that. So, um, you know, maybe absence is more like the jigsaw puzzle and it's not that something's missing, but it's just that parts of it are in other places than we think they might be. I'm gonna jump in there, that's such a great, <laughs> I loved your um, dramatization of our trying to fix it into the computer. <laughs> Here was my ridiculous attempt to resolve that problem this semester. I, I uh, taught a course um, for undergraduates at the New York Public Library of Performing Arts trying to bridge digital humanities with archival research to see if I could, you know, we could begin to have that conversation to also get students excited about doing archival work, but also to a foray into digital humanities. And my sort of, um, don't laugh at me, but my attempt was to also say, how do we confront dance and the archival films on their own terms, right? How do we actually, can we make visual arguments that places dance and choreography at the center of a kind of um, experience of learning or interpretation? So it was sort of, to be really brief, we developed this software that um, allows you to, and the New York Public Library actually started this, but we sort of developed it, where you could um, juxtapose video or students learn basic film editing so they could um, kind of manipulate the film that we had permission to manipulate, which was actually a great um, sort of choreographic analysis because they were literally transforming choreography or trying to um, adapt it according to you know, um, against and alongside what the actual source of the material was, right? Which is 16 millimeter film put onto VHS, then digitized and now on YouTube, right? So then they were um, transforming it once again. But the sort of, to wrap, you know, and then annotation, and there were all these tools that they learned trying to create an experience where we can make, create visual arguments that allow dance to sort of reveal something central of historical significance without necessarily, um, you know, outside of or complement it somehow with language. Anyway, the lesson was, right, that even how these archives are also a type of absence, right? You could look at a Pavlova film of a ballet, right, and we have the archive, this one, you know, 45 second clip of her dancing, right? But it's not the dance in history. It is just, you know, some clip of her performing it, not on the stage where she did perform it, not with the lighting or with the live music or even, you know, so it sort of became amazing in this exercise was how limiting the actual archive was, right? How, uh, in, in for some dance that, you know, the, especially around film, but how limiting it actually is to some of the arguments that we want to make or the historical questions that we have. I think one of the things that it can do also, and I love that you're engaging the archive by 
playing with it, um, is also that I find it allows us to defamiliarize any of the concepts. It defamiliarizes time, it defamiliarizes um, the idea of a stage, it defamiliarizes, so any one of these things, not, it's not just that you can historicize it, it's that you begin to have plural ways in which these things always already were, but um, I, I read recently that people using different languages have different senses of duration of time, amongst other things, right? So there's the, there are these ways in which by continuing to be quite close to some of these materials, you're actually making them stranger and stranger. I mean, we know that from all of these other forms. But to say, why have dance and aesthetics? Why not have it in medicine? Not from a contemporary 21st century medicine, but because it is a medicine. In, according to all sorts of cultural practices. So by allowing that, I think it has created spaces for me and for, I mean, it's not intended as a selfish project, but of, of care and of um, attention that uh, I think are generous ways of uh, allowing ourselves to educate and be with each other with questions, I think the ones that came up that I thought were very tender in our groups today were transmission, um, and in that case, that was Janet's project of, of, of disease as well as cross-generational work, um, and McGreed also talking beautifully about um, uh, care. You know, there, there are items that are in the object, because uh, in the archives, because they've been sealed, but s stolen, but there are also those that have been cared for into that moment in time. And so to be able to see the care and to be able to apprehend the questions of transmission has actually been, I'm not saying that I'm arguing for a recuperative process, but a way in which like a real appreciation of a plurality of cultural practices that don't fit any particular category but can tend to other possibilities um, has allowed dance to not be stuck in these on the stage, on the you know, particular time frame, chronology, et cetera. Um, I think I have just a very brief answer to this idea of uh, engaging absence. And my immediate a answer when I thought of your question was just that I'm not so sure that I want to deal with absence as much as what I'm really dealing with is trying to make visible what we don't see but is there, so it isn't really absent or to speak what's unsaid. Um, and so it's about saying, actually, this isn't an absence. We just thought it was. <laughs> um, and to Tommy's question of why do we try to put it into that thing, to words, <laughs> uh, I think two things. We try to convey it to people who don't have it in their bodies, who don't dance it, and as a, as a way of maybe transmission, whether that, that actually leads to them moving or leads to the, just their greater understanding of what the heck we're doing. Um, but also to convey to other movers, other performers across time. So speak to the performers, the dancers of the future, or we the performers of the pre present read something, say Ted Sean said about what he was doing in the past, um, and that kind of transmission. Yeah, um, it's interesting that you all picked up on the absence part, because I was thinking of it not as absence presence as a binary, but of absence and relation, right? And so I was thinking about then the second part of it, uh, you talked a lot about this kind of cross-temporal relation, right? And, as, uh, and I'm wondering, like, is this specific to dance studies in some way? Is this, uh, what happens in terms of a transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary um, approach? And does it change our relationship? I'm thinking of you know, Catherine's comment um, earlier about how it's different if you're talking about live versus dead subjects, right? Um, but also I'm thinking about the earlier working sessions where we're talking about not just interrelationship but intra-relationship, relationships within ourselves but then also complicating the notion of where the edge of the self is, which came up just earlier in our roundtable talking about collaboratives versus individuals. It's 
amazingly huge. Uh, I don't know that it's just for dance, but dance is of our, you know, we tend to think of it as being of our bodies or of our spirits or of our, you know, kind of volition or, um, so there's an ofness to dance maybe that's important here that, that dance is of something that is, is not in its name. Like it's not just of dance. Dance does all these other things. It doesn't just dance. So there's always this kind of relation. I was just thinking as you were talking though about being an improviser and um, you know the kind of imagery that comes through. We, we learn dance body to body, but then we also learn it in relationship to sound and smell and to to video and other kinds of archives as well, written archives and you know this kind of like constant um, streaming of information that goes all over the body and through all kinds of imagery uh, as you're performing. And I, you know, I think as researchers, we do that too. So this kind of relationship to, I mean, Paul's been talking about it so much, like your relationship to Ted Sean and St. Dennis keeps changing day to day as you reflect more and more on these archives. So, so I, I don't think that's just for dance, but I think we're maybe more attuned to it because we are in the, the space of the sensorium as we're trying to do our research in certain kind of ways. I think this came up in the morning session too. I think also maybe if we think about dance as an art or dance as religious practice or social practice, it's already tied up to some ideas of historicity, right? So the, the, to take on dance is already to deal with someone engaging with a kind of tradition and history. It's already uh, it's somehow engaged with, you know, the choreographic is already, not always, but over, you know, already tied in with the historiographic. And what I hear you saying is that it already implies within it right, a pastness. And it's the relationship to the pastness that's part of what the choreography is, right? Yeah. That's what you're saying, I think. No, it's an interesting thing, um, especially given, uh, and I mean, VK and Catherine, you should feel free to jump in here um, at any time. Uh, in <coughs> the working sessions, uh, in the morning, the one that I was a part of talked a lot about um, corporeality in terms of healing, and healing being a process that has no temporal end point, right? And that the point is it's a process, right? And so to think about um, that question then of a kind of completely different notion of temporality then arose in the afternoon session that I audited in thinking about exactly how it is that we can even recuperate something in an archive that and, and to, to already treat it as uh, separate from us that we can go into an archive and have any access to some embodied practice from a historical past is to separate out that uh, embodied practice from our uh, current own embodied practice as the person who's doing the research. And there's a relationship to that, to the morning set, back to the morning session, which was thinking about the way in which um, the body becomes ill. Wh when, it, when the body becomes ill, you understand it as object, right? Or when you understand it as object, it is ill because it's not integral in a certain way. And so I just want to kind of trouble that boundary a little bit and think about that in relation to temporality. Uh, it was Chloe Ray Edmondson's work um, also raised the question, uh, yes, of drunken times and intoxicated times. And so I, I think that there were these, I, I was in both of the same sessions, so there were these extraordinarily beautiful kinds of conversations about healing. And I also found that, I mean, certainly intoxication and, and um, drunkenness can be parts of healing also, right? But they can also be parts of um, loss and, and, and any number of things. So I think there are ways in which, um, the, even if we can think about the, the self-loss and exploitation and all of these things as being ingrained within the sensorium and the ways in which we apprehend moving through the world and temporality and memory and so on, that I think some of the forms that we're interested in um, bringing into conversation allow us uh, a complexity of, of both metaphor and trace and memory that allow us into um, pressing the limits of the categories um, so that it isn't only is it healing or is it intoxication or is it appropriation or is it participation and immersion, but that this continual movement through can be looked back upon as any of these one, these moments and scatter and refrain somewhere else. And I think that's where the capacity to be collaborative gets very exciting, is you follow one thread and then you say, oh, okay, that has fallen into this 
existing pattern and how do we um, take the thinking somewhere else? Yeah, and just what you last said, I mean, that is the power of collaboration, is that when your boundaries are set or when your concepts are reified, there's somebody there who's gonna, gonna bust it up for you and make you <laughs> rethink everything you thought was true <laughs> the day before. This right there, I mean, that's, so it kind of tilts to what's next, or maybe it's not what's next, but we have got to disrupt this single authored manuscript project. Like, that's just so dead. It's dead, <laughs> dead, dead. But, you know, it's, it's really hard. These structures, these institutional structures keep wanting us to claim, you know, solo space, just what you were saying. But, you know, we, I don't know if we have the power, but we got to do it. We just have to. We have to, we have to push against that. And you know, it's this what you're talking about collaborative. I mean, it's just, you know, that that's just what has to happen. Sorry, <laughs> I <don't> have words. <laughs> you don't need to apologize for that. <laughs> I think we definitely agree with you on that. And I think, I mean, that's an interesting uh, problem. Then, right? Is this something that we can contribute to, perhaps by talking about process in our research, so that what we're what we're privileging in the work itself is something other than the product. Right, which is understood as a commodifiable entity that's going to be attached to a single individual, right? And that 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 might be one possible direction. Are there other possible directions or methods that you can think of to um, to make uh, live Tommy's <laughs> Tommy's <laughs> manifesto and, and reality? <laughs> no, I was just going to ask Tommy how he wanted to do it. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, it does seem like it's easier first to bust up the individual part than the commodification part. Yeah. Uh, that seems to me even harder, at least to where I'm at thinking right now. Well, I'm with you. I mean, we have lots of examples now in all kinds of activist circles of you know activist projects that don't claim authorship and don't claim identity and don't claim necessarily sort of beginning, middle, or ends, but claim space as projects. Um, you know, so we know it's possible, but. But these are the kind of special artist type people doing this, artists, intellectual activists. Um, there's like kind of this, this, this mass consumption of social media. And we had this really good conversation about Mass Camp uh, that came up in, in our group that was just fantastic for me to think of it that way, like, or for all of us. Um, but you know, trying to make the space where, um, yeah, the commodity part, it's, it's just tough. I mean, you know. It, People are growing into lives thinking that branding themselves is the way to kind of achieve something that's sustainable and gets beyond bare life. And you know, and they're, they're, there's a way that the world we're in is saying that that's true. So then, how do we, as as intellectuals, as academics, as dance instructors, as artists, how do we help resist that and make open spaces? Um, you know, the first thing I would do would hand the mic out to someone. <laughs> That's, that's breaking up the individual, is to drop the mic, to share the mic, to stop so offering anything, to make collective <laughs> spaces. Um, and you know, if you get, if you stay in the, in the game long enough, it does become possible, but then the ethical question has to be keep, keep being reignited. Where are my ethics? You know, it's not about me, so what does it mean it's about? And how can we collaborate? And what will that look like? And, and make space in our lives, in our, you know, our, our daily choice making. Yeah, the, um, I was thinking about this, and you were talking about how this is a world that values branding of our own stories and our own identities, that we started the session telling our personal stories, right? And so I'm curious, how has your story changed over time in relation to your research? Wait, repeat that question exactly. <laughs> I was just saying that, you know, in this uh, society, as Tom was saying, that, you know, values branding of individual identity or individual narratives. Right, so you are who you are on Twitter, as opposed to the kind of m multiplicitous, uh, you know, un unfixable uh, quality set of qualities and in process. Um, but in this roundtable, or as I said, two small roundtables, the um, the the conversation began by each of you telling your stories, right? And I'm wondering how your story has changed over time. We've been telling these stories a long time, but they're not the same each iteration. And so I'm wondering how your research has affected that um, narrative of yourself that you tell as the narrative to get to the research. 
I since I started that pattern for better or for worse, I'll take that one up. And just like if there are little eyes looking up at this guy, um, or tables. Um, I think that I, I see the criticism of uh, beginning with the personal narrative as the point of entry in, but I think that also what I was doing with that to an extent was what you're raising now, which was that I went in each time with a, it's a habit, oppositional stance in relationship to a topic. And each time by being in that oppositional stance found myself changing and other possibilities, including ones that I would certainly now be like, oh no, that's not where I want to go with my work. But the practices of scholarship that included creative labor and collaboration allowed for, I think, levels of mutability with that, that um, I, th I wouldn't say whether or not they, def I mean, certainly there are questions of privilege, I wouldn't say that they defy the, um, a uh, question of commodification, but they've allowed a reflection on embodiment, relationship, location, um, politics of history and art that have, I think, substantially changed <coughs> at each iteration. And that, that for me is what I'm trying to share when I'm teaching and otherwise is that it's not a continual self authorship kind of scenario, but that these are tools that allow pushing those um, frameworks imposed on us in these marketed kinds of ways into playful and, and oppositional stances that can be transformative, even if that transformation is an, its own paradigm, but also small, it can be big. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm trying to formulate a, a thought here. I mean, mostly where I went to is like, yeah, why did we all start with a story? But it's so powerful, right? Um, and I think that goes to what we were saying about in publishing too, and the giving the book a sense of a story and the question of whether stories are lies because you shape them to have a certain affect and to have a certain kind of journey and you know, I've also always been dealing with narrative and dance and whether dance can escape narrative or whether it can't quite because of how we perceive something, we perceive and understand the world in terms of story, or do we? I think we do. So, I don't know, I, the story always shifts, it has to because, I think because of our distrust of stories. If I tell the same story over and over too many times, I don't believe it anymore. And I think I'm repeating lies about myself even if they were once <laughs> true. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, it's not a fully shaped thought, but those are thoughts that came up. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know if my the stories changed so much as, um, I'm at a weird <laughs> time in my life where I'm uh, I'm beginning to think of my work very differently. That I think I and I still feel, you know, politically, um, personally motivated, you know, on how I choose how I choose to spend my time and what topics I want to write about. But I also have a sense that that'll come through no matter what I'm writing about. And I sort of am thinking about what the next few years are or projects I take on. I'm sort of not thinking only about, um, I'm thinking, well, I need to know this because I don't know anyone else who knows this and I feel a sort of obligation to the field or to my students. It's a very different thing. And th I think this was also a, a colleague of mine um, recently retired and she gave me boxes of research, you know, and it was basically projects that I think she was going to, you know, finish and realizing, oh, I'm already collecting that box of things that I think I'm going to get to write and to think about and follow up on. And, um, you know, she gave me the box and said, y you have to finish the box. And I was, you know, and there's, you know, and now I have, you know, students and grad students who are going on, I'm like, you have to write this, right? And it's, you know, I don't, you know, that it's not only about, you know, my desire, but feeling like trying to figure out like where, what's gonna make an impact What's relevant? I also feel like you know I'm based in New York. I have the dance division down the block from me, and all of these archives. I feel a responsibility, even though my my 
I have to say my first project was, how can I not go to the dance division of the New York Public <laughs> Library, right? Because I, it was in a terrible state. But now I feel like a sort of obligation to that amazing institution and what it has that, not that it's going to define all of my work, but I do feel a different sense of responsibility and sort of about what I feel, um, you know, I think are the glaring gaps in our shared history of dance and performance that this raised for me quickly the thought too, we were talking about who is telling histories and who can, and um, I also would say that almost everything I choose is a bilingual history. And I think that sometimes we absolutely miss telling the story that's shared um, or looking at the trace that is of more than one already. And of course, in some ways you could say the trace itself is always more than one, et cetera. But that if we, um, if we believe that things are in utterly separate categories, there is no story really to tell, but that as we actually take the time with what's in between, and there isn't a between to be in between of, but if we understand that there are complex um, shared stories that are habitually told in oppositional forms that that is continually repeating the structure of a category that is itself doing. And I think as much as I appreciate performance and performance studies, the, the kinds of voices that come from the Butler thing of performance and performativity do and are actually in many ways the structure itself, that if we understand that that repetition is um, is authority, then we can also push against that structure in the in doing that work. And just one quick extra thought: I was thinking about the nature of narratives and individualism since we were, and it's very very frequent that we attach a story to an individual. There's a protagonist, but it's not essential. That's not an essential connection. We can tell stories about groups. We can tell stories about relationships that are complex and large webs. We don't have to tell the story of Oedipus over and over again, right? <laughs> I think that, unless Tommy wanted to say anything. Uh, no, just, yeah, yeah, I guess I, you know, it took me a minute to think it through. Uh, those stories change. I mean, 10 years ago, I'd never have talked about being a, a little queer kid in Indianapolis, Indiana. Never, 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 never. So there's a way that how I entered the academy and when and who I thought I was and who I thought I wanted to be that's all changed through time, you know, in relationship to my own creative practice, my writing practice. So it, maybe it's inside of everything that we're saying to each other about um, these things are not fixed and how we stay curious, stay thirsty, my friend, but how we stay kind of curious about possibilities is, is what makes more possibility. And, you know, it's just such a different day now than it was uh, eight months ago um, <laughs> that, you know, claiming space, you know, even if it sounds individualistic, it also can be a collective claiming. Um, you know, we need queer kids of color in this room. So, you know, that was very, and that was your, your point too, it's like, so that was very intentional, even though it's not like I pre-planned saying something, but it's like, it's an intentionality about our choice making and how we're narrating stories or narrating ourselves or being oppositional. Um, but then being, being suspicious, always suspicious, always a little bit bitter, you know, black art is bitter. Um, <laughs> You know, but, but keeping those things going alongside each other um, seems just really, really urgent to stay engaged in this way of skepticism that I think you're helping us r remind us. Well, I think, that, I mean, this is an interesting opportunity then to bring in our audience, and we have some time for questions from the audience for all of our panelists. Uh, thank you, Jennifer and Elu, for uh, helping with their mic microphones so that you can properly be heard. Thank you guys so much. This is incredible. And I guess I just want to, in terms of um, how we told these introductory stories today, like there's something for me as someone who was a little kid who was a dancer and came to the academy and all of these things, to hear lauded scholars in a room tell the stories of their professional academic trajectories as lauded researchers, um, starting with when I was a kid dancing, right? And that that's not the thing to 
set aside that delegitimizes us, but that that can be a tool of legitimation is really powerful, actually. Um, so to be in this building and have those stories, I really appreciate. Thank you. Yeah, in the in the session D that BK was, you were um, leading, you were talking about, or a, a term came up, the eroticism of the archive, which I, I came in partway through, but I came to understand it as a sort of um, like sensual, intuitive um, encounter with, and personal encounter with the archive in a way to, um, yeah, in a, in a way to, um, and the ethics, the ethics of uh, approaching the archive from a very personal per point of um, point of view, and this story sharing echoes that for me. That there's actually like an eroticism to the story sharing <laughs> to to make take it there, you know. But like, but there's a, a personal like there's an ethic to it also. I guess that's that's interesting in terms of our like collectivity as everyone in this room, you know, like. Um, by bringing yourself and your story to the table, there's like a certain collective dance as we then, you know, move towards idea sharing. You know, to begin from the personal is a really beautiful place to begin. <laughs> I'm nervous for some reason. <laughs> there's a question over here on the right. Oh, I have a question on top. Um, <laughs> you, you can go first and then we'll bring the microphone over here and you can go next. Um, I wanted to ask you about, so there, there was a recurring kind of, uh, I think, theme about stories, uh, both your own, but al also your work as, uh, as a story, and bringing to light of processes or of, um, you know, things that belong or were in the archive and how do you um, resurface them and so on. Um, and I was wondering, so this is a question that's not about methodology as such, but rather perhaps about the dance of the work or uh, the performance of the work itself um, and of the product of the work um, and, th and how, if at all, um, does your, our emphasis and attention to non-representational modes of um, being uh, inform the product of our work. Does someone want to take that up? It's <laughs> a good question. Um, I like this question of the non representational and, and very complex, expanded questions of the mimetic and the non-mimetic and its relationship to colonization and so on, I think are um, at the center. Um, one of the places where that's come up, I think the, the essay's coming out in a little while, but for me was looking at um, lines drawn in gold and silver. And so when you look at them, and, and like I'm just seeing it now, and maybe it's a trick of my particular eyes, but things that glint, things that reflect, do something to the visual field that's quite different than representation, I think. Like that it has this moment of relation that's cast that I will see a glint off. I'm seeing it from people's plastic right now, their name tags, um, that will be quite different from the next person who's looking from a different angle. And so looking at these also then also said, well, where is this gold and silver coming from? This gold and silver is coming from um, the, the ex extractivism of, of the colonial project. And so it has been a way to uh, uh, write closely to the sensorium in a certain way, but also to look at that as scriptive and in relationship to scripts that have a history, to, like the history of paper is of deforestation too. <laughs> look, look at that. So allowing both to be in a dance, as you said, like what's the dance of the project? What's the dance of the... Um, the, the labor that we're attending to, like Vinardizi has this book about the construction of the stage that is also the ecological destruction of forests being part of the same moment. So whether it's, and there, there are reasons to critique the anthrop Anthropocene as a model, and it, but some of these questions, when we bring the question of ecology or the question of perception or non-representation, we can also 
come back to, well, what is the material and economic structure that's shot through with the way we perceive? And so I think that's where I've been thinking about it. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm inspired by so many things that <laughs> flowed between you. Um, one thing that keeps ringing in my head is collaboration. Um, so I want to ask a question about collaboration. Um, so among scholars, but also with other kinds of interlocutors, uh, dancers that we write about, and, I, and I'm particularly interested in collaborations across ontological fields, not only the ontological taxonomic fields of our you know, disciplines, uh, that was redundant, but I think <laughs> it's because I don't know how to say it, um, you know, taxonomies and all that, but uh, also ontological in terms of um, you know, the, the, the uh, pluriversal uh, condition that we live in as human beings that under modernity coloniality uh, is forced into the, the, the universal ontology, right? So how do we talk across ontologies um, and collaborate um, as equals across those ontologies? Um, it's something that I'm <coughs> experimenting with in my own work and um, and a question came up during the session. Uh, I think your name is Ante. Uh, Ante asked me a question that bothers me that I ask myself all the time that I'm trying to fit all these worlds on this little <laughs> machine made out of extracted materials. Um, just, you know, why do I refer to uh, these legitimizing scholars from, you know, the, the, the canon? And why don't I just have the conversation with the interlocutors? And I, wo I work within the field of, uh, well, it's not a field, it's, it's just a practice of um, contemporary indigenous dance in Mesoamerica. So I have two versions of, of, of articles I'm working on, one which is for you guys, <laughs> and one which is for my, you know, my friends. And I, and I don't know how to make those connect. <laughs> and, and then fi and finally, and I'll make this real quick, and then, and then the, the, the archive and the eroticism of the archive and objects, because the, um, uh, well, my friends who I work with have relationalities with objects that are very intimate. And, and how do we listen to the objects of dance, right? Um, so I was a, a research fellow at NMAI, National Museum of American Indian, and I encourage anybody who's interested in archive to go because there's a ceremony room. <laughs> They're referred to as grandfathers and grandmothers and um, it's just a fascinating place. So just think about that. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> Do you feel those projects have to com uh, come together? And I ask because it's, it's, I think it's a great impulse we have, but I feel like so much of our conversations have been trying to, it's a good impulse, to bridge and connect, but also understanding that not all of these arguments and addresses, right, what, what Tommy was saying. I, I'm just curious to know if you could say something about, because I think it's a fascinating question. Um, I think about my work and what does this mean to, you know, or I get pushback from, uh, you know, dancers or people, folklore dancers who are invested in histories of Mexican dance. But I'm curious, do you feel that the, these, to need to come together, these registers of thought, or I mean, are they different ideas that create, you know, that do different things in different spaces? Wait, your, your book, actually, which I'm rereading now, <laughs> is making me um, think about that even more because, w I, especially in Mesoamerica, we, we have, <laughs> we had uh, libraries of texts about movement practices, and they're gone. And so, and now we have uh, uh, contemporary Mayans and Nahua peoples and, and others who are, are um, it's not recuperating, but they're continuing. You know, we are literate people. This idea, you know, the, it's not, yeah. 
yeah, there's, there's literacy in indigenous societies. Um, and it's continuing. So on the one hand, maybe these worlds don't need to talk to each other. And that's okay, maybe. But on the other hand, um, there, and, and actually from, and I'm talking about Grupo Sotzil, my principal interlocutors and friends and collaborators right now in Guatemala, they want to they wanna talk to the world. They want to read you. They want to read your work. They, I tell them, oh, I'm reading this, and this is the idea. What do you think of this? <laughs> uh, well, from what you tell me, it sounds pretty interesting, but I don't know if I understand. We'd like to read it one day. But it's all in English. <laughs> you know, most of it is in English. So it, there's not a one answer, but there's facets. There's possibilities. And I'm interested in those possibilities. And I'm interested in knowing how you see those possibilities and how you're working through them, if at all. I mean, I know among us, right? But also be, be beyond this thing that we're in that's called the academy. Thank you. Do any of you want to speak to that uh, issue? The proliferation, perhaps, and, and expansiveness that we can communicate with and connect with others. I only have a, a few quick thoughts. It's a massive and important question, and I just wonder what about it. It's, I agree with Paul, it doesn't have to be the same project, but what about an expanded concept of translation, rather than just translating the book for your friends and collaborators? What about a way of writing which you know, translates ideas from, because it's really just about, it's about different audiences and different languages, and language is not just in, in the most literal sense. Um, but if you, if you feel your role is, is a, a bridge, then that, that, uh, that function can be in your writing. And no, maybe you don't write one thing, but maybe you do write two things that kind of approach each other. Other questions? Can I ask one? <laughs> yeah, I um, think we have time for one more, so I th think it's only appropriate, Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a bit of a practical question. I was so, Tommy, inspired by what you were saying, or just felt it so resonant, that sense of needing to just push out of this individualized authorship thing, right? And that this, these things that are required by, by, the, by the academy, by us. And then in particular, feeling our own position, which is extremely precarious at the beginning of our careers. <laughs> are there avenues, are there places, are there directions where you see sort of like tangible avenues to kind of push beyond that or ways to collaborate? Because it's something that I think about and dream about, but it's hard to find a, an avenue for it or a space for it that feels like you can hold on to something. Uh, you're not wrong, of course, and, and it's, it's, you know, it's the devil's in the details. It sounds great to get passionate, but then what does that mean? You know, so Paul's involved with digital humanities kind of initiatives, and these initiatives are circling back. So there's a way that, you know, VK keeps, keeps reminding us that we're always engaged in these histories that are so deep and wide and that keep telling us the same things over and over again, but we fail to recognize them again and again. So this model of science as the model for arts research predicts the possibility for collaboration. We resisted for the years I've been in the academy, in the humanities we've resisted. We're not scientists, we don't do these co-author, that's not what we're about. But that's actually a model. So you co-author, you have five authors, the place in the, the ranking that you are tells you how high it goes on your list. Well, this is new for the humanities because we've grown up in a system that was individual investigator, or individual PI, or PI and then others, but one person telling the story. Um, but we, there are models in other fields of the academy. So if we're just gonna go into the academy, so that model could be useful for us to start doing more co-authored. There are collective publications coming out. I know that the postdoc I've been fortunate enough to be affiliated with for the last three years is publishing pieces as collectives creating artwork and creating publications as collectives. So, um, you know, that's another model that's, you know, the question is then does, you know, do big poobah <coughs> full professors recognize that? And I'm just like, well, yeah, some do. So then, you know, you've got to find your allies and find your, um, your um, advocates and the people who will stand up for you and pound on the table and say, this collective model is, you know, this is what we need or this is what's possible. But I think that, you know, the science model is as bankrupt as it might seem does give us evidence of another way of thinking about the kind of work we're doing 
um, in a way that's already valued inside the academic corridors, if you will. Um, so digital humanities can help build us towards those models, as unfortunate as they might be. But there's something else. <laughs> it probably should have ended with Tommy's amazing thing. Um, one of the things, yeah, I mean, I think one part is to be able to choose one's collaborator, because I think that's, I mean, it's not always, but it, it's an important part of it. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to say was I, I went to a history conference, and I sort of went, you know, somebody invited me, I was very excited, but I didn't necessarily expect to see a whole ton of collaborative models coming out of that particular site. Um, and there were a number of them, and they were amazing. And one of them, and they very much respond to the political moment, but um, uh, I think finding voices for public-facing scholarship and making that a consistent every year part of what you say you're producing, what you guys just did with this awesome event <laughs> is precisely this kind of thing. So I think sometimes that, it, especially the way that gets gendered, the way that gets tracked within the academy is super problematic. But always finding the formulation and having the conversations that allow that to become something. And also finding are there ways for that to also become part of print, I think is, is an important part of that conversation. And so there's a way in which, like there was one example in our class this year, we had a number of really interesting people come in and talk to the students. And because uh, we had a student who had an accessibility issue, we were handwriting a number of these in order to be able to pass them on. Now we lost track sometimes, it wasn't totally continuous, but we realized that we had a pretty remarkable archive of written texts with artists and conversation that had been produced across this and that there was a possibility for collective publication there. So we'll see if we manage to do all of this over the summer and so on, but I think there are ways in which um, deciding that it's public facing also making the milestones so that you don't end up on the wrong end of the stick of um, an already very asymmetrical structure, but finding formulations to work with is um, where we can go with it. I'm exciting. And you guys have done something really awesome with this in particular. Yeah, and this is, a, I think, a good place to end unless there's uh, any final comments from the rest of our roundtable participants. Um, the, uh, the, the idea that sharing always exceeds that commodifying what happened today is not something that you do because you get a certain amount of money for it or a certain amount of credit for it per se, right? It exceeds the boundaries of that, even if you may get a little money for it. <laughs> um, and uh, anyhow, I just wanted to thank all of you for being the collaborators and make it possible to have that kind of sharing that exceeds those bounds of institutions and exceeds those bounds of discipline. So a big round of applause for our roundtable participants. <laughs> Thank you. So um, we're uh, coming up is going to be the uh, Bureau for the Future of Choreography. Our organizers have asked me to announce that we all need to step outside briefly because they're going to rearrange the physical space here. And so you can take a break. Please be 